million. Uh, you probably all recognise me because I used to be in the Newlys. Thank you. For, I love that. I love that. Like, if you came out in America and you went, I used to be in the Newlys, even if people didn't know what the Newlys were, they know that they're supposed to go, Woo! Yeah! You come out in Ireland, you go, Hello, I used to be in the Newlys. And people go, So what? <laughs> You're not fecking with them now. Could be fecking choice. <laughs> well, I always remember my history teacher, a father, 800 years of oppression. Saying, at the end of the day, when you think about it, wasn't the potato famine just caused by a parasitic fungus? The Brits. <laughs> and we don't mind. We do not. Sure, it's all water under the bridge. It's the past. It's forgotten. Well, who remembers it now? Who remembers? We don't remember. Who remembers what you did to us? The rape, the pillage, the torture, stealing our land, our language, totally emasculating our ancient heritage. We don't care at all. We do not. We don't mind because we're great crack. The way we look at it is, feck it. Didn't we get some great old songs out of it? <laughs> it's true, isn't it? We, we got our whole ballad singing tradition, and I'll tell you an interesting thing about them. The main prerequisite to be an Irish ballad singer is not musicianship, it's hairiness. <laughs> I think the hairiest makers you've ever seen, huge big Celt rolls on their heads, huge big planks of hair. <laughs> when they stand close together, they just look like eyes in a bush. <laughs> and the amazing thing about them is they're born, not made. An Irish ballad singer is born, not made. When an Irish ballad singer's been born, his mammy's lying there. She feels the baby coming. She gives a little push. She says to the midwife, is it a boy or a girl? The midwife sees the big beard coming out between her legs. And she says, Jenny, it's neither. It's a feckin' ballad singer. <laughs> She grabs hold of the bearded baby, yanks him out, smacks him on the arse. Does he cry? He does not. No, he goes, An English man stole my potato. I, uh, I'm looking out now of a few pals in the audience, and it's a different arena from what the boys have seen me before. The last gig the boys came to see me, I did in the Spy Bar in South William Street. Does anyone know the Spy Bar in South William Street in Dublin? Well, a pal of mine, I couldn't get any gigs, you know, so a pal of mine swore to me out with this show in there. So I arrived late, and I'd never been in the place before. I didn't know what it was like, so I didn't know how I was going to open my act until I saw the bouncers on the door looking like something out of a Ralph Lauren catalog. <laughs> so what I did was I decided, you know, on my first gag, I'd allude that the boys were gay. <laughs> and I thought, you know, being big macho man, it might get a few laughs. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I have to inform you that the spy bar on South William Street is a predominantly gay bar. <laughs> Now, my mate who set me up at the gig hadn't bothered to impart this small <laughs> but ultimately fucking vital snippet of information. <laughs> so there I am on stage in a gay bar saying, Jesus, lads, if you'd ever any problems in this place, you'd have the boys loping in like an ad for Nivea men who dare to care. <laughs> Come on, Cecil, let's get these fuckers. <laughs> Charlotte, Charlotte, we need backup, we need backup. We need to, come on, come on guys. Get these guys, spank them into submission lads. Spank, make them behave, make them behave. Watch the shirt, it's our man, you brute. <laughs> Carrying on like a clown. And so at this point, ladies and gentlemen, one of the lads from the audience decided he'd get up on stage and give me the beating I deserved. <laughs> and he would have succeeded if not for the intervention of, for want of a better word, his, um, his, his bitch, <laughs> who screamed, the scumbag isn't worth it, babe, <laughs> and saved my ass. <laughs> not literally, Jesus. <laughs> the whole idea of karma came round to me. About two weeks later, I was doing a gig in the International in town, and I parked outside the spy bar, and sure, lo and behold, the car was nicked. On the following day, I went down to the police station to check up on it, you know, see what the progress was, and the 
Guard is sitting behind his desk, he's reading the newspaper, sipping on cups of tea, nibbling on Jaffa cakes. And he didn't give a shit about me or my car. He said, Anna, we wouldn't have even had a chance to start looking for that car, you know. There's, there's a lot of crime out there, you know. A lot, of, a lot of young lads on drugs were fierce busy in here. So if I was you and I was going to go home, relax about the whole thing and give us a call in three or four days. I mean, I didn't expect the fella to leap out from behind the desk, give me a hug and tell me everything's going to be okay, you know. But a bit of sympathy would have been nice. So I went nuts, you know. I turned around and I said, Hey, Jesus Christ, the car's gone. I haven't had insurance. I'm dead. I haven't paid it off. What are you going to do about it? Suddenly, his professional guardy victim training counselling <laughs> kicked in. He offered me a Jaffa cake. <laughs> a fucking Jaffa cake. My car's gone. The lads couldn't give a bollocks. If the biscuits were lifted, there'd be running gun battles on the streets of Dublin. Thanks very much. How are you doing? You probably gathered I'm very influenced by the blues, which is a bit weird because I'm a middle class white Dublin boy and that's not really where the blues is coming from, is it? In all honesty, I wasn't much uh, racially oppressed or made to grow cash crops when I was brought up in Rathgar. <laughs> so the blues for me is a bit like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> I was born in a hospital, okay? <laughs> there were no real complications. <laughs> Taken home to a huge house with loads of food in the fridge and a big colour telly. I had a good education. Um, grand thanks. Come on, me. It's kind of an occupational hazard being Irish because you grow up, uh, you grow up in Ireland. There's so many great Irish bars. Fantastic. We have great Irish bars, and I don't mean the one that was built in Temple Bar last Tuesday, with the bike up on the wall over here and a big row of leather-bound volumes, because what an Irishman likes to do on a weekend is go out for a good old read. <laughs> I don't mean those places, I mean a real fucking Irish bar with nobody in it, except one old character down the far end of the bar with a huge beard all down his arms. <laughs> Six or seven of his children in his trousers. <laughs> Some sort of clerical collar, normally. And, uh, well, I didn't put him there. I'm just telling you about him. He's got a job. He's got a job, that guy. His job is to go, ah, young fella. <laughs> Give us a song. And you have to write it for him on the spot and hand it over to him. And more often than not, he goes off and has a huge international hit with it. And you never get a shagging penny. I can hate Bono. <laughs> It is, it's cool to be here. Obviously, um, to people who are here uh, in Vicker Street, it's important that you switch off your phones. That is vital, because I'm using some heavy-duty electronic equipment right here. <laughs> you know, it can affect its navigation. And, and oh, of course, the important thing is, if I guess people at home, you can leave your phones on. But as a mark of courtesy, please don't ring anyone in the next eight minutes. Yeah. Uh, it's, and, and of course, the usual, if your phone has a camera on it, don't think you're any better than the rest of us, you know? Because it's a gimmick. And this time next year, it'll be something else. Like, you'll meet someone in the street and they'll go, yeah, have you seen my new phone? Yeah, it's got a George Foreman grill. <laughs> oh yeah, it cooks tiny chicken wings in quite a healthy way, yeah. <laughs> Last night was a really good night And even though we didn't get off with each other I'm pretty sure we will if we go out for another But we drank quite a lot And I may have said certain things Things that I'll regret As they were not completely 
accurate. I said I live in a lighthouse. I said I work in genetic research. I can't speak Greek or Arabic. And neither can the guy I spoke Greek and Arabic with. I never taught a class in Reiki or Pilates And I'm not a black belt in Judo or Karate I don't play the cello with the symphony And my cello music won't be in Toy Story 3 <laughs> One more thing I'd like to clarify You see, I told you I was single Last night Well, disregard everything else I said to you but that one fact, that's completely true. <laughs> completely true. <laughs> Has anyone here gone through a breakup at all recently, actually? Because I went through a breakup, and it's unbelievable. It's, how does it happen? You know the way you're, you're mad about each other when you first meet, and you th you're like you're thinking things like you know you find things in common that aren't in common at all. Like they're going, oh, shoes. I have a pair of shoes. <laughs> and, Lou, that's my favourite colour. Uh, uh, and then it turns from that into you can't even look at each other anymore. You know you're at the dinner table, and all you can hear is. <laughs> <laughs> you're going, if you don't stop breathing, I'll rip your heart out. <laughs> I just. It changes. And, and, and it just changes so much. And then you know the way that and women just change completely because, you know, like when you start going out, they wear these lovely underwear and all, that's all gone in a matter of weeks. All gone is the lovely pants that you took off the first night. You have these women's fucking wonder pants that they put in and their head goes through the top and walk through the house like this. <laughs> uh, only a woman will come up to you and go, there's no magic left in this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell did I do? I always look crap. So, I just, and I always start so. I remember when I met her; it was amazing. I was in Scotland and I was there uh, doing gigs and stuff. And uh, I was at this club, and <laughs> Irish people would have loved this place. A 24-hour bar with a bank machine in it that served food. This is it. Was Irish people walking on? Is it true? Is it true? <laughs> I've heard about it. <laughs> I was in there, I, was, I remember the barman coming over and going, you're going to have to leave, you're drunk. I said, oh, of course I'm drunk. You've been serving me for a fortnight. <laughs> uh, 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 after a few days, anyway, I saw this girl and she was gorgeous. I was there going, man, I have to talk to her. And I couldn't get near her because, you know, all fellas would be like, and I thought, no, nah, be a man, stick your neck out. So I walked straight up to her, picked her up, and I ran out of the pub. <laughs> Uh, and then I said, I want to kiss you. And it was a lovely romantic moment. And she went, I so do what, and we kissed. And, it was and then I thought, imagine trying that here. <laughs> Picking up some woman in Ireland and running out of the pub. You'd be like, get your fucking hands off me! <laughs> You're in the front of the Evening Herald with a black bar across your face. <laughs> Dirty Dublin scumbag picked up lovely Irish lady. The Pope is freaked out! And I, I, do you know what amazes me about Irish women, though, is we've become so promiscuous. Or am I just speaking for myself there? <laughs> no, but it is incredible. We've become very sexually free and easy, considering that we do have a Catholic background, a lot of us, or it's kind of riddled through our society anyway. And anybody who has been to a convent school like me, the one thing you're left with in your mind is the mantra of a nun in your head going, if you have sex before marriage, you will rot in the fires of hell for all eternity. <laughs> So, when you never to do, you think, ah, feck it, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I was having a one-night stand with this guy, right? And it's just, it's just kind of odd, right? Because we were in bed together, and, and he said to me, what would you like? And I thought that that was a bit of an inappropriately intimate question. I mean, we'd already been through foreplay. We'd been drinking all night together, but it, <laughs> but still, I thought you don't know me well enough to say that. So I didn't know what to say. So I just gave my sexy little laugh. <laughs> to kind of 
kind of put him off. And he said, no, seriously, Anne, what would you like? And I was so delighted he remembered my name <laughs> that I said, do you really want to know what I like? And he said, yes. And, and I said, I'd really like if this one night stand would turn into a relationship. And if maybe a year down the line we could get married, maybe buy a little house by the sea, have two or three children, never allow the kids to become drudgery, as I've, I've seen happen with other people. And also, within the context of a relationship, we'd always acknowledge you can't expect to get all of your satisfaction there, all your personal, emotional, and creative fulfillment. So we'd always endeavor to have outside interests, pursuits, and friends, so that ultimately, we could look forward to growing old together. And uh, there was a silence. And he said, would it be okay if it just stuck my finger up your hole instead? <laughs> And I said, okay. <laughs> That's all for me. Thanks very much.